Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. I don't know about you, but ever since last Sunday, I've been sort of trying to pay attention to my joy level. Remember, Jesus told us if we're going to be uh, successful, if we're going to maximize our potential for reaching out to others, we're going to have to have the full measure of his joy. So as we go through this series on what I'm calling the real Lord's Prayer, I want you to remember that the Lord Jesus wants you to have his joy so that you can make his message more attractive. I wanted to do this series, the real Lord's Prayer, because it, it reveals to us what Jesus desires of his disciples after Easter. Seems like a lot of times there's this big build up to Easter and then we just move on to something else. But I thought if we looked at this prayer that, that Jesus prayed the night he was betrayed and arrested and taken away to be crucified, I thought it would, it would reveal to us what the Lord expects of us now that Easter has passed. So our text this morning and really next time I'm before you again, is going to come from John chapter 17. And we were looking at John chapter 17 last Sunday. And this is, again, what's known as the high priestly prayer of Jesus. I'm simply calling it the Lord's Prayer. So if you want to go ahead and turn over to John chapter 17, that would be a good thing. By the way, this is the longest prayer in the New Testament. I'm not going to read the entire chapter to you, but I'm going to try to hit the high spots within the prayer. So last Sunday, we talked about the importance of joy. Today, we're going to turn our attention to another important ingredient that we need to possess if we're going to maximize our potential at evangelism. John chapter 17, and today I'm going to be reading from verse, uh, chapter 17, verses 20 through 23. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, talking about the apostles, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one, as we are one, I and them and you and me, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So we see in this particular section of the prayer that Jesus is praying for unity. He's praying that his followers would be one in their intent in their purpose, just as Jesus and the Father were one in their intent and purpose. Jesus knows that if they're going to be effective at evangelism, he knows if they're going to be effective soul winners, he knows if they're going to continue to make the Great Commission go forth, they're going to have to be unified. They're going to have to work together as a team. You might say they all are going to need to be on the same page to get the job done. As I emphasized last week, evangelism is the overarching theme in this prayer. We see it from the beginning of the prayer to the end of the prayer. Jesus wants his followers to be about the business of making disciples. He still wants us to this very day to be about the business of making Christ followers. And if we're going to get this done, number one, we're going to need to be people full of joy. And we're going to need to be people who are unified. Have you ever been asked this question what kind of church do you attend? Or what kind of church is New Discovery? Or in reference to your religious affiliation, they may say, oh, what are you? And you'll say something like, well, I'm, I'm just a Christian. Of course, that answer doesn't seem to satisfy. The next is usually, yeah, I know you're a Christian, but, but what kind? Now, these are usually innocent questions where someone simply wants to know what denomination you are affiliated with. You know, are you a Baptist? Are you a Methodist? Are you a Presbyterian? Are you Episcopal, Catholic, Pentecostal, etc.? What are you, they'll ask. Well, as you, you may know, if you've been here for any time at all, you will know that we are 
non-denominational. We do not wear any kind of denominational name. Have you ever wondered why that is the case? I hope you have. The reason goes all the way back to this passage that I just shared with you this morning. Jesus prayed for his future followers to be one, to be unified. And why? So that the world might believe. New Discovery is a part of a, of a movement that takes Jesus' desire for unity very, very seriously. This movement that we're a part of is, is known as the Restoration Movement, which started back in the turn of the 19th century in the United States. So it's a little over 200 years old. It it's, has an interesting history, and I won't go into all the details this morning, but here's, here's basically what happened a little over 200 years ago. There were Christians in the United States who were tired of all the division among Christians. And they wanted for the church to work together as one. So Presbyterians and Methodists and Baptists decided, not all of them of course, but some of them decided to do away with their denominational names because they all agreed that going by all these different names tended to be divisive. So they said, let's just call ourselves Christians. Let's just be Christians only, and let's go strictly by the teachings of the Bible. However, this movement wasn't a unity movement at all cost. It wasn't a let's let anything go just so we can be unified. Unfortunately, we see that sometimes in our world today. There are those that want unity at all cost, and they're willing to sacrifice everything to get the unity. This, this unity movement was not like that. This unity movement was based upon Scripture alone. It had to be biblical. They wanted to build this unity movement on God's word. There are some religious slogans that helped guide the movement. And I think it's important that we, we stay familiar with them here even at this church so that we can maintain our unity. I'm going to share some of the slogans with you and briefly explain uh, what they were getting at. One slogan is this, where the scriptures speak, we speak. Where the scripture is silent, we are silent. In other words, if it's clearly in the Bible, we clearly advocate it. If it's not clearly specified in the Bible, we leave room for opinion. That might make some people uncomfortable. But if you're ever going to achieve unity, you have to allow for opinion, especially where the Bible is not specific. I really like this slogan. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, love. Now here are some of the essentials. The fatherhood of God. That's essential. The deity of Jesus Christ, his son. That's essential. His atoning death on the cross for eternal life. That, that's essential. The virgin birth. Jesus' sinless life. His second coming. That, that, that's essential. These are all very important parts of the Bible that we need to believe. The, the doctrine of heaven and hell. That's an essential belief in the Bible. It's, it's clear, specified. Um, we could go on and on. Some more might be the, the authority of God's word. That's certainly an essential. We believe that God's word is inspired. That's an essential. Uh, the Lord's Supper uh, that's essential. Uh, baptism into Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. That's what the Bible says. That is essential. Those are some of the essentials that united the movement. If they could come together and agree upon these things and see how it was specified in Scripture, that could hold the movement together. Those are some of the essentials. In the non-essentials, they believe in liberty. Again, freedom of opinion. Everybody's not going to see eye to eye on everything. If you think everybody's going to see eye to eye on everything, you know, I've, I've got something to sell you somewhere. You know, it, it's, just, it's just not going to happen because we all come from different backgrounds. We've had different experiences that color the way we see things. It's just, it's just unrealistic. I don't want to say that. I, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe the Holy Spirit, once he's inside of us, he can guide us into truth. So, so I'm not going to say it's unrealistic. It is realistic for us. I believe we could see everything eye to eye, but it takes us getting in super tune with the Spirit of God. But there's going to be things that are matters of opinion. I'll give you an example. You may think it's a dumb example, but it, it was a big deal at one time. Some people believe when you're baptized, you must go down forward. 
I'm one of those that like to go backwards. But you know, if you come to me and say, John, I, I, I want to go forward. I'll say, okay, we'll take you down forward, man. Or if you, you might say, I want to go sideways. You can go sideways, okay? That's a matter of opinion because the Bible doesn't say you got to go forward, backwards, or sideways. Does that make sense? There's all kinds of issues like that in, in Scripture, especially when you start dealing with eschatology and the end times and all the details of how the Lord's going to come back. There are so many ideas out there. It, it is mind-boggling. I mean, we had a Bible study one time on the end times and we studied all the different views and we all kind of came away a little bit confused because they all seem to have some weaknesses. You see, that's the nature of prophecy. It's shrouded in mystery. Oftentimes, it, it, you don't get it until it's already happened and you look back and say, aha, now I see. You see, the Jews completely missed Jesus' first coming because they were looking for something else. But after he came and died on the cross, you can look back at Isaiah 53 and say, oh yeah, I see it now. A lot of times that's the way prophecy is. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying we can't get edification from prophecy and we can't learn some things from it and it can't help us. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that you need to leave some room for opinion in, in some areas of Bible prophecy because it's not always easy to understand. We could go on and on with this. We could argue about the color of this floor. I don't really like the color of this floor. Some of you may like it. You know, that's not an essential. I'm not going to split hairs with you over the color of the walls or the floor or carpet or anything else like, like that. See, those are non-essentials and we have to leave room for opinion. Last part of the slogan is in all things love. Love should really govern everything we do. If you really love other people, you're going to have patience with other people. You are. You're going to have patience with them. You're going to have patience with those whose views are more liberal than your own. It's going to help those of you who are more liberal uh, not look in contempt upon those whose views may be narrower than your own. You know, I think of what Paul writes to us in Romans chapter 14, verse 19. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Make every effort. So as God's people, we're supposed to strive to get along with one another. Another slogan that guided the movement was this. No creed but Christ. No book but the Bible. They believed early on that creeds tended to be divisive. Now you know what a creed is. A creed is something that a bunch of men have crafted and put together to try to keep you on the right track problem is some of these creeds disagree with some of the other creeds that have been formulated. So they just said, well, you know, these creeds, even though some of them may hold some truth and some of them may be spot on, they tend to be divisive. So let's just not have any creeds. Let's only have this creed, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That'll be our creed because that comes right out of the Bible. So they, they believe that creeds could be divisive. One, one more I want us to look at, one more slogan. This is not all of them by any means, but some of the more important ones. I really like this one. We are not the only Christians, but Christians only. What do they mean by that? Well, in our zeal to be biblical, in our zeal to restore the, the New Testament church, we shouldn't get to the point where we think we're the only ones saved. And sometimes people make that error. We should never get to that point. We should realize that we're not the only Christians out there. You know, I think it is noble that we try to get it right. I think it's noble that we want to be one. And I think it's noble to strive for unity. But we can't get to the point where we think we're only ones saved. That certainly would be divisive and counterproductive. If you don't believe me, just go to someone at a nearby denomination. Say, we think we're the only ones saved. See what happens. You, you probably have a war on your hands. Even if you say, I can back it up with scripture, you know, and then they'll back it up. And the next thing you know, the, the, the bond of peace will have been disturbed if you want to look at it that way. But, but at the same time, we do not want to wear a man-made name. We just want to be Christians only. Nowhere in the Bible does it say we're supposed to wear a man-made name. Do you, have you ever thought about that? I challenge you, look in scripture and see if you can find a Quaker or an Amish. You ever thought about that? Or an Episcopal, or a Roman Catholic. And you could just go on and on. No, in Scripture, they were simply called Christians. Let's do a little exercise that illustrates kind of what I'm driving at here. Again, we want to be one so that the world might believe. I would dare say most all of us here have come from various different backgrounds. 
church background. Some of us, Baptist, Methodist, Episcopal, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, etc. So on the count of three, I want you to say out loud what background you come from, okay? Everybody with me? When I say three, I want you to say what church background you grew up in or what background you were previously affiliated with before you came here. And I want you to say it real loud so everybody can hear you, okay? One, two, three. Wow. Okay, on the count of three, I want you to say Christian. One, two, three. Christian. Now, which message was clearer? <laughs> See what I'm saying? There's an unsaved world out there that wants to find Jesus. There are some people looking. There are some people searching. And it sends a much clearer message when we are simply Christians. Unfortunately, the Christian world at large hasn't done a very good job at achieving unity. Have you ever looked in the yellow pages under churches? It is unbelievable how many churches are out there. I looked on Wikipedia not too long ago, and according to, to, to Wikipedia, there are 38,000 denominations. Can you believe that? 38,000. It's probably climbing. 38,000. You know, Jesus prayed for his followers to be one. It must break his heart when he sees all this division up on the earth. So I think as a, as a, as a whole, we need to strive for unity among the churches at large. But I also think this principle can be broken down even to within the local church. Just as we should strive for unity among Christians at large, we also should strive for unity among ourselves. Because if we achieve unity here, it's going to maximize our potential at reaching other people for Jesus. Now, as I mentioned last week, I, I preached about us having joy. And I told you, uh, I didn't think we were a bunch of miserable, sour people. That this, that sermon was being preached in a proactive manner so that we wouldn't be sour, negative people, but joyful people. It was a proactive sermon. I think on the most, for the most part, we we're joyful. And the same holds true here. I, I don't find us to be a contentious and argumentative, mean-spirited kind of congregation. This sermon, like last week's, is, is proactive in nature. But isn't it interesting that in this prayer, Jesus didn't pray, Father, I pray for great sermons to be preached so that the world might believe. Father, I pray for great music. I pray for music that will engage the culture so that people might believe. Oh, Father, I, I pray for miracles so that the world might believe. He didn't say that, did he? He didn't pray for those things. Isn't it interesting that he prayed for unity? He prayed for the believers to be one. And in verse 22, the, the, I find it very interesting that the church is to be a reflection of the unity that exists between God and Jesus. How close is that? You know, God was in him, he was in God. I mean, that, that's, that's pretty close. I mean, you, that's... That's as close as it gets. And Jesus is praying for us. And notice, you know, last week we talked about the full measure of joy. and he, he was praying that specifically for his apostles, but we can make an application that we realize we're going to need, need that too. But when it comes to unity, he's praying specifically for us. He, he's praying that, that, that those who will hear their message, the apostles' message, that they would be one just as he and the Father are one. And, and, and that's us. So this is a little, little more personal. So we, we as Christ followers, we're supposed to be a very close-knit group that works together to bring others to God through Jesus. Remember, the, the, the mission of Jesus was he, he came to seek and save that which was lost. Lost people. He died on the cross. Why? So people who are lost could have a relationship back with the Holy God and ultimately get to go to heaven and spend eternity with him. That was his, his primary mission. Now that Jesus is gone, he's given us that mission 
It's called the Great Commission. Well, we're supposed to go out and make, make Christ followers. But if we're going to, to make Christ followers, he's saying here, we have to be one. We have to work together. Again, we have to stay on the same page. You know, Jesus taught that a house divided against itself cannot stand. Wouldn't you agree that makes unity pretty important? Not only does a divided church hinder church growth, it also endangers our very existence. It is essential that we maintain our unity. So with this in mind, let's take a look at some of the common threats to unity that are found in the Bible. This is not an exhaustive list, but some of the major stresses that, that encroach upon unity. One is a legalistic spirit. You're probably thinking, John, what is a legalistic spirit? Well, a legalistic spirit is someone who is into imposing rules and regulations on the others. Oftentimes, these rules and regulations are mere opinions. Someone else's opinions. Something that someone else more spiritual has formulated. The Pharisees in Scripture are a great example. They loved rules and regulations. I mean, they tried to come up with all sorts of things. You know, what is work on the Sabbath? You know, carrying something that weighs as much as a dried fig. I mean, they, all kinds of things. In fact, they, 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 they said that they built a hedge around the law of God. In other words, they came up with all these rules and regulations that would keep you from actually breaking God's law. So in order to keep you from getting there, you had to obey all these rules out here that they came up with. And they were constantly locking horns with Jesus. They were constantly on his back because he broke their man-made rules. Now this kind of legalism reared its ugly head in the early church. Now, some of these same type people, these Pharisees that loved all these rules and regulations, they brought that legalistic mindset with them into the early church. You can find it in the book of Acts. You know, they, they, they were wanting to impose all these dietary laws on new Christians. You know, no ham, no catfish, no bacon, no shrimp, no lobster, no clams. How would you like to live under those rules? Forget about going to Red Lobster. Ain't gonna happen. They also said if you want to be saved, you also must be circumcised. And all this caused a schism and a rift in the early church. It was so bad they had to call together a special council to settle the issue. Now, unfortunately, legalism has made itself known down through the centuries. It, you know, I would dare say more churches have been split over legalism than any other kind of ism that's out there. Again, this is when people impose their opinions on others. Opinions about hair length. I even had someone tell me once hair shouldn't touch the back of my collar. Where'd that come from? Have you ever seen that in the Bible anywhere? In fact, if you really wanted to get historical with them, you could say, you know what? You're advocating a pagan Roman hairstyle. You could say that, but they probably won't understand what you're talking about. People have argued over pants. Who should wear pants? How tight should the pants be? Skirt length, jewelry, makeup, musical style, instruments, eating in the church. I even heard of a church that built a fellowship hall right next door to the church building. And they wanted to put a walkway between the two buildings, a covered walkway, so that when it rained, they could, they could go from the church into the fellowship hall and have dinners together. And they had the covering go all the way up to the fellowship hall, but stop a little bit from touching the building because they said, if that walkway touches the building, then that's going to be the church. And we believe it's wrong to eat in the church. See, that's the lunacy of legalism. First of all, the church is not a building, right? We do understand that. Well, we'd be in big trouble around here if it was wrong to eat in the church, wouldn't we? Some of y'all would be guilty. Do you realize there's some people out there that would call you a sinner because you're eating right now in the church building? How dare you? If you really wanted to get biblical about it, you could just go to 1 Corinthians 11 and say, look, dude, they ate in the early church. When they came together, they had a potluck dinner. 
I mean, really, just go to Scripture will solve a lot of these things. So it's not wrong to eat in the church, okay? Besides, you're the church, not the building. But that just, again, illustrates the sheer lunacy of legalism. Next, we come to what I'm going to call a, a critical spirit. A legalistic spirit's bad, but so is a critical spirit. We can look back to the Exodus when the Jews were coming out of Egypt. One thing that really distinguished them or marked them was their critical spirit. It wasn't long into the journey that Mary, Miriam and Aaron criticized Moses. And God wasn't very happy about that. In fact, uh, it brought down God's anger. It brought down God's judgment. Next thing you know, Miriam became leprous, as white as snow. Yes, God does discipline his people sometimes, and it's not always pleasant, but that wasn't all. Later on, Korah and followers were critical of Moses and Aaron's leadership, and guess what? They got swallowed up by the earth. The people in general were critical, and they brought down God's judgment upon themselves. So not only were their actions acts of ungratefulness, but they also threatened the unity of God's people. God wanted to take them out of Egypt, this, this place that was full of sin, and he wanted to take them to the promised land. And he wanted them all to be unified. Now, folks, God's taken us out of evil. He's taken us really out of this world, and he's taking us to the promised land. And if we're going to make it there, we're going to need to be unified people. Paul tells us in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 10 and 11, that all these things happen to them as examples for us. And as warnings to us. So be careful that you don't develop a critical spirit. Make sure you're not someone who spreads seeds of dissension among church members. You know, the real list of seven deadly sins that are an abomination to God is a person who sows dissension among brothers. So keep in mind, that's how on God's list. He, he really does not appreciate it when we have a critical spirit and we spread dissension among others. In fact, it, it calls for God's judgment. Another threat to church unity is a contentious spirit. It's very close to a critical spirit, but a contentious spirit. Paul writes in Titus chapter 3, verse 10, warn a divisive person once and then warn him a second time. After that, have nothing to do with him. Wow. That doesn't sound like something you'd hear preached in a church today, does it? Aren't we supposed to love and forgive and show grace to people? Yes, we are, but there is a limit. Now, Paul's, this, this unity is so serious. He's saying, you know, if someone is contentious, warn them, warn them again. If they keep it up, don't have anything to do with them. In other words, shun that person. That is scriptural, believe it or not. There are just some people, as you know, that go around looking to pick a fight. Some people, I don't know why it is, but some people like to just go around and stir up trouble. Even if it is something from their childhood, they're still not supposed to do it. God does not want us to be contentious people. So he gives this instruction to Titus, who's been left behind in Crete to establish this church. You know, you can't put up with people who are troublemakers in the church. You know, some people like to be contentious in the area of Bible doctrine and trivia. Uh, Titus 3.9, Paul writes, But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Now, I've never heard anybody in the church today arguing over genealogies. Have you? I've never heard people really arguing over the Old Testament law, but I have heard people arguing over Bible doctrine. I've heard people get into some heated discussions over Bible prophecy. In fact, I've even heard a church sign saying, you know, we're pre-millennial, post-trib, blah, blah, blah. You know, letting you know out front that's what we are, and if you don't like it, don't come here. Today, people do argue over the Bible. Now, I'm not against discussing the Bible. If, if I was, I'd be in trouble, wouldn't I? I think it's healthy to discuss the Bible. One man sharpens another. You know, we, we need to discuss the Bible. I don't see anything wrong with studying Bible prophecy. In fact, the Bible seems to advocate it. But we need to make sure that our 
discussions do not degenerate into controversy. What are the two subjects you're never supposed to bring up? Politics and religion. You know, that whole religion thing, you see, that, that's just a situation that can just go up in flames if you're not careful. But I do believe we're supposed to talk about religion. What do you think? I mean, how are we going to accomplish the Great Commission if we don't bring up religion? Now, see, the world would love for you just to shut up and don't bring it up. Don't you talk about God. Don't you talk about Jesus. Don't be a Bible thumper. That's old-fashioned, outdated. Uh, this is the way now. You know, the world would love to shut us down. We can't shut down. We have to talk about religion. And by religion, I mean Christianity and what God's Word says. And again, I think it's profitable to even talk about the second coming. Jesus is coming back, the Bible says. And he does say you don't want to get caught off guard. He's going to come like a thief in the night. He's going to, and twinkling of an eye, and it's going to be too late for some people. So, so it is profitable to talk about these things, and God expects it. We just need to be careful that we, we do not let our, our discussions really cause us to become argumentative and combative and mean-spirited. Here are some practical, practical suggestions that I, that I came across on how to avoid an argument. And I believe uh, they would prevent an argument in the church, uh, among church members, and among contentious co-workers, family members, and maybe even your spouse. First of all, change the subject. When you feel uh, that a conversation is headed toward controversy, just change the direction of the congregation, uh, not congregation, <laughs> a conversation, and skillfully try to get out of it. Two, don't bring it up again. If you know it's a volatile subject, you've been over it over and over again, you, you've hashed it out before, just don't bring it up again. Sometimes we can disarm an argument with a sense of humor. Now, when Tony Campolo was once asked his view of the second coming of Christ, he said, I do not know. I'm not on the programming committee. I'm on the welcoming committee. Sometimes we're better off just to walk away. If somebody is, is forcing the issue, it is better to just walk away rather than lock horns and get in an argument with them. Sometimes we may encounter some people who are so primed for an argument and determine that nothing works, and the ultimate response is really to have nothing to do with them at all. Avoid them all together. In conclusion this morning, I want you to never forget how important unity is for Jesus. He knew his time was running short. He didn't waste his time talking about trivial things. One of the weightier issues in this prayer was unity. Jesus was all about unity. And we need to strive for unity as well, not only for ourselves, but also so that the world might believe. Bob Russell in his book, When God Builds a Church, uh, tells about a church. It's a, the, the illustration is a little dated, but it makes a very... Very important point. He, he tells about a church years ago that began bickering over the use of a musical instrument. Half the congregation wanted to use a piano, an instrument that was gaining popularity at the time. You know, if you study history way on back, the piano was sort of associated with the saloon. Okay, but eventually it became a more popular instrument and it was brought into the church. Some people thought it was a great idea. They were probably thinking, man, this, this is culturally relevant. This will help us engage the culture. But there were other people, half the congregation that, that he's talking about in this illustration, half of them saw the piano as a tool of the devil. And they did not think it should be used in the church. So the next Sunday when the, the church uh, came together, uh, they found a brand new piano on the stage. And to the horror of half the congregation, it was being played during the congregational singing. The half that disapproved walked out of the building in protest. The next Sunday, everyone was back. But guess what? The piano was missing. Those who bought it could not find it. They looked for months as accusations flew back and forth about the thievery. Six months later, the piano was found. 
It had been hidden in the baptistry all along. The moral of the story, when the church fights, the baptistry isn't used very often.